please feel free to use the chat to ask questions or to share resources that um, you think might be of interest to the rest of the group. We really do find that learning from one another is one of the most important features of our webinar experience. So we want you to be part of that and feel like um, you can bring your own expertise to this experience because we know you have a lot to, to share with your colleagues. Our topic today is on inclusion and how inclusion is good for STEM and how STEM is good for all young people. Oftentimes it seems that STEM programs, especially if they're a, a club in after school time, are seen as something that's just for those kids, for, for the STEM kids. And um, we want to talk about why it's important to provide STEM experiences that reach all the young people in your program, not just those that are interested in a STEM club or a robotics club or an ecology club. In the webinar, we'll identify and analyze our own strengths and challenges in facilitating inclusive learning experiences. And we'll also be um, learning some new strategies we can use to address the needs of all learners. And I will make a note here that inclusion is a complicated topic because we're talking about including all learners. And the strategies that are necessary to make sure that your program is inclusive uh, of girls or that your program is inclusive of minority groups or that your program is inclusive of students with physical or mental disabilities, all of those are going to be a little bit different. But we're going to focus particularly on including students who tend to be underrepresented in STEM. And um, we will talk about how you can address the needs of those students and help them be part of your STEM program. Again, I encourage you to use the chat box if you have questions. I'm just going to adjust my screen a bit here so I have it up and I can see if you have um, anything you want to share or add to our discussion today. Diversity in science refers to cultivating talent and promoting the full exclusion of excellence from across the social spectrum. This includes people from all backgrounds that are, tend that are traditionally underrepresented in STEM and those that are represented in STEM. It's important because the work uh, of STEM today happens in teams. It's not individuals who are solving problems in STEM. It's really teams that are solving the most important problems in our world today. And when you're trying to solve complex problems, progress often results from taking a different point of view. So when the teams that um, are working on these problems represent a pretty similar background or, or a a similar set of experiences, if they're all coming from kind of the same place, they don't have as many um, perspectives to offer to that problem. It's challenging to work on a diverse team, but diverse teams tend to be more productive because they do bring more ideas, more background, more experiences to that um, problem solving process. So this is why first, Inclusion is good for STEM. Lack of diversity in STEM fields leads to a lack of talent and hampers our ability to solve problems. Looking ahead, in order to meet the needs of the future STEM workforce, it's going to be necessary to draw from a wider pool of people as um, we need more and more professionals and technicians in the STEM fields. So attracting more women and people of color will be essential to being able to fill that workplace. And attracting people with um, physical disabilities, with um, different backgrounds, with 
who have faced different challenges is going to be really important in bringing their diff those different points of view, those different ways of thinking about problems to the field. So the first thing I wanted to get across is that it is important for the future of the STEM field that we have inclusive programs in our after school and particularly in after school because after school teen, youth that are underrepresented in STEM like um, urban African American males tend to be overrepresented in our after school programs and being able to bring STEM experiences to those youth that tend to be underrepresented in the field is one of the strategies that's really going to help us in that long term view of, of bringing more diversity to the field. It is also important to remember that STEM is good for all youth. STEM learning experiences create critical thinkers. They increase science literacy and they enable the next generation of innovators. Whether they're extracting DNA or building ramps with wooden blocks, innovation by young people leads to new products, new processes that sustain our economy. Innovation and science literacy are built upon a solid knowledge base and a base of experiences and learning in STEM. Without access to high quality STEM experiences, large segments of our youth will be ill prepared to effectively participate in the modern STEM based workplace. And they'll be left out of opportunities to have a lot of really well paying jobs. So out of school programs are particularly important because they do provide opportunities to engage young people in STEM without them having to worry about being graded, evaluated, or tested. Fun, hands-on learning experiences build confidence in STEM, and they let youth deepen their understanding by applying their, what they've learned in the classroom in different ways. Out-of-school programs have the potential to bring STEM experiences to young people from a lot of groups that have been underrepresented. And I'm particularly interested, and you'll hear a lot of focus in this webinar on computer science, because I know how often we use computer science and computer technology every day in our work lives and in our personal lives. We're all using computers today in order to communicate and learn together. So I can only see how these skills in STEM in general and in computer science in particular are going to be really important to young people. As I said, it's going to help them be critical thinkers. It will increase their science literacy, their ability to use science every day in decision making and in their work, in their schooling, in their learning. And the sort of STEM experiences that we have in after school in particular really enable innovation. They um, help students tap into those creative ideas that will bring out new ways of solving problems. So for our future, it's important that STEM is inclusive and it's important that all young people have that opportunity to participate in STEM experiences to know that it's a field that um, is open to them and that there are lots of opportunities. One of the things to keep in mind when we're talking about STEM, we're not just talking about um, doctors and nurses in medicine. There's also computer technicians, there's lab technicians. There are a lot of people who support that STEM field who don't need to have four or eight or 10 years of college education. So we want to make this field accessible to all young people and let them know that there's a place here for them. Um, whatever the, their vision of their future is, there's lots of STEM opportunities and often those opportunities are gonna give them the um, ability to have a job that they enjoy and that they can support a family with. So all of these things it are lead into why STEM is important for young people. To emphasize how critical it is to develop an interest and a sense of STEM identity starting in elementary school, 
I'm going to share a research study with you that had a really catchy title that caught my attention. It's Computing Whether She Belongs, Stereotypes Undermine Girls' Interests and Sense of Belonging in Computer Science. And I'll be posting a, a link to the article when I um, post a recording of the webinar, but I'm going to put it in the chat box now too because um, it really did inspire me as I was putting together this webinar. And I, um, it helped me see this in a, in a different way. So in this study, researchers noted that computer science has the lowest percentage of women graduating with bachelor's degree in all the STEM fields. So it's a particularly concerning problem in the area of computer science, this underrepresentation, lack of diversity. So this study examines the relationship between interest in computer science, sense of belonging, and the effects of stereotypes on how adolescents make choices. The authors realize that high school is a critical time for identity formation when students are making choices that can broaden or limit their future career options. So the study was done with high school students talking to them about options in college. So in the experiment, they wanted to examine how the learning environment can reinforce or challenge cultural stereotypes. To do this, they created two computer science classrooms, and the pictures that were actually used in the research study are here on the screen. So that's what we're looking at now. Um, they created these classrooms and they took pictures of them. Students didn't go into the classroom, but they looked at the pictures, or in one part of the study, they had a, um, the classroom was described to them. The classroom on the left side of the screen was one that the researchers thought reinforced cultural stereotypes about computer science. As you can see, it's a regular classroom that's just been um, enhanced with, with a few props. They added things like there's some video games on the floor, video game controllers in there. There's um, sci-fi posters on the walls. There's tech magazines and computer parts. So they tried to make it what they thought was a stereotypical environment for computer science. The second classroom, the one on the right on your screen, was one where, where they tried to challenge stereotypes, to create a learning environment that didn't reinforce those stereotypes. You can see there's plants, there's a plant in this room, well, plants in this room. There's nature posters. The, there's some magazines, but they're general topic magazines. And there's a coffee maker to make it seem welcoming and inviting. I'm gonna pause for just a minute so I can take a drink, sorry. Sorry about that, I'm back now. So we've got these two classrooms and what they did in the study is they asked both male and female high school students how interested they were in computer science. That was first before they did any intervention. And then they shared the pictures or they described the classrooms where a computer science course would be offered and asked students to rate how likely they were to enroll in the course that was gonna be offered in these classrooms. They found that girls reported their interest in, the girls' interest in enrolling in an introductory computer science classroom was significantly increased when they um, were told about or saw the environment on the right that challenged the stereotypes. In contrast, the interest boys had in the computer science course was about the same. So when they asked them before, how interested are you in computer science? The level of interest they had in computer science was reflected when they were asked about whether they would take this course, regardless of what classroom it was in. And that's really significant because one of the things it says, or it helps us understand is that the interest boys have in computer science won't be highly impacted 
by changes we can make that would make it more interesting for girls, which is exactly what we, our goal is in diversity. We want to attract underrepresented gr groups, but still keep the attention and interest of the groups that are typically part of those STEM fields now. So the fact that the boys' interest in the chorus was just as high when the space was created that they thought would be more welcoming to girls is just as important, I think, in these research results as the fact that that space on the right did increase the interest level of girls. And in fact, the space on the left didn't make changes for girls that had a lot of interest in computer science. If they had a high level of interest in computer science, they were just as interested about um, taking the course in that room. But girls that had less, a lower level of interest were more likely to be engaged by the classroom that challenged stereotypes. The other thing I really like about this is this is the sort of intervention that we can do in after school programs. We can enhance our environments using posters or plants or other things to make it seem more welcoming and um, perhaps build more interest, uh, especially around girls, in taking these um, STEM courses. So, the second thing I wanted to focus on in our webinar today is to think about our own strengths and challenges in creating an inclusive environment. So the goal in this part of the webinar is to identify and analyze our own strengths. So I want you to focus on the potential for success in STEM in your own program, the programming that you do with young people or the programs that you work with. If I came to observe your program today, what inclusive strategies would I see? If you have some ideas just on that, on things that you're doing in your program that are inclusive, and you'd like to share them in the chat box, I encourage you to do that while I get a drink again. And when you're sharing in the chat box, um, make sure that your comments are going to all participants or all uh, panelists and attendees so that everybody can see your ideas about what is working in your program. And for this exercise now, I think it'll be easier if you can get out a piece of paper, if you have something that you can just jot a few notes on in front of you, it, it will um, make this exercise a little bit more useful for you. So think about three young people who offer you the biggest challenges in terms of creating an inclusive program. And try to think about specific people um, because it'll um, make the activity work a little bit better. Um, and you can write down their names or, or their initials. That'll be helpful. Um, I'm going to be thinking about Ben and Sam and Josie um, as three students that, that I think are challenging in, in terms of, of including them and what, what we're going to do about it. So you've got your three students. You've written down their names. Now, for each of them, think about what makes that person, that individual, unique, precious, or good at something. What are their strengths? I'll give you a minute to write some ideas down.
So I'll share a little bit about what I'm thinking about. And if you would like to um, share in the chat box about the people you're thinking about, um, you are welcome to do that too. So for each of the individuals I, I named, I came up with some strengths for them. Um, ben is an excellent reader. He's reading two or three years above his grade level and he's a strong leader. The, the challenge is he doesn't always lead in the directions that I would like him to go when we're doing activities. Sam is not as strong academically, but he's very creative and innovative. And Ben and Sam tend to come as a unit. They do a lot of things together. Josie, on the other hand, is a little bit more of an outsider. It's hard to get her engaged, but she's very nurturing. She's very active and physically strong. So those are some strengths that she has. Does that make sense what I'm asking you to do? So hopefully you've got your people in mind and you've got some strengths for them. This approach that we're taking is um, based on positive youth development. It focuses on emphasizing the strengths and the potential of young people and developing protective factors in their life rather than focusing on deficits or problems. And um, by focusing on strengths, it's a way to that really supports us in developing a more inclusive program. So as I said, my challenges are with Josie, um, she tends to stay on the outside of activities. She doesn't want to get involved, but she's very nurturing. She's caring. She's very active. Sam and, and Ben come together as a unit, and Sam is the one who's creative and innovative. Ben is the one that has strong academic skills and leadership, but neither Sam or Ben are likely to use those in the direction that I'd really prefer that they do uh, when I'm trying to engage them in an activity. So keeping those students in mind, I'm gonna move into the next part of our webinar where we're gonna highlight five strategies that can help your program build on the strengths of students and um, offer them experiences that are going to be open and inclusive of their different backgrounds or different learning modalities and their different abilities. In the chat box, we have some really great ideas about making our programs inclusive. Um, the first one is about including students in the planning, in setting the goals, and then in evaluating the goals of your program. And that is a way that's really gonna help you understand what it is they're trying to do and it also increases their support of the program if they help design and, and develop it so that's a great strategy for being more inclusive and really understanding where students are coming from oh okay i i see that we're having challenges again because it looks like the the chat has defaulted to sending it to just me as a panelist. Let's see if I can share that back with everybody. So here are the ideas that I was referring to. Thanks for noticing that it, the chat box is empty. So first, engaging students in planning and setting the goals and in, in, um, setting direction for your program, and then also in evaluating whether you're reaching those goals. Second comment is about assigning roles so that every member of the team has something specific that they're contributing and that it's a meaningful contribution is really important. Um, roles could include recorder, presenter. That's another really good idea. And um, some activities really lead themselves well to it. One of the activities on Click to Science about testing for uh, earthquake is uh, one that has really makes use of those roles in in a different way all right so let's look at some more strategies that can be helpful okay the first strategy we're going to talk about is examine your assumptions 
it's easy when we're looking at a group of, of children or young people to focus on the sameness, to assume that the youth in your program have had similar experiences to you, especially if um, they've grown up in the same part of your community. You know, if, you, if you're from the same neighborhood where, where your program takes place, it's really easy to, to assume that they've had similar experiences to you, or even if you are not from the same area, you may realize that you've had different experiences, but assume that the youth in general have had similar experiences to one another. So it's important to think about what are the differences? What are the backgrounds, experiences, families, or expectations that make each student unique? How can you broaden your view of success for the youth that you work with? And how can you broaden their view of success? And that's one of the things that we want to do in the activity that I started before. So I identified my three young people and I've identified what it, are their strengths. Now the next part is to think about what does success look like for them? What are ways that I can define success for them in my program in a way that aligns with what they view as success, how, how they want to be successful. And th that's what this first one, this first strategy is about. Examine your assumptions. Think about what assumptions you're bringing into program planning and think about how you can broaden that and in particular, you can broaden your view of what success looks like for the young people you're programming with and can get a better sense of understanding how their point of view is different from yours. And that's where Jean's um, suggestion about including students in the planning process can really be helpful in helping you see those different points of view and the different values and experiences that they're bringing to the programming. The second strategy is build an inclusive community. What steps can you take to build a sense of community in particular around STEM in your program? There's some things that you can do in general to make your um, environment feel in inclusive and welcoming, like learning students' names and using those names, learning how to say their names correctly, and, um, you, and making that effort. There's a good chance that you do know the names of all the students in your program if you're working directly with young people. Most of us know that that's important and we do it. But do you know the names of all the mentors and volunteers that come into your program as well? Are you able to use their names? So all of those things can be helpful in making an environment that is inclusive. How can you help the mentors or volunteers in your program learn the names of the youth? If they're only coming in for one day a week, that can be challenging. Are there things you can do to help them learn about the youth, about their backgrounds, and what makes them unique, their own views of success? And can you help them be part, more part of your community, those volunteers and mentors that aren't there every day? What are things that you do to express your genuine care for the youth in your program and where they're coming from? How do you help students connect with one another? And how do you help them connect with STEM? If your program isn't using STEM mentors from a high school or college nearby, is there a way you can do that? Because that sort of role modeling can be very effective. Do you have former students who've been part of the program and now have aged out that might be interested in being STEM mentors for, for the current young people in your program? The more inclusive you can make that environment and the more role models you can bring in that have a that show different aspects of STEM and different ways that different people from different backgrounds are successful in STEM, the more successful you're going to be in engaging all the young people in your program to try out STEM. 
the next strategy is um, setting a positive and inclusive tone. <clears throat> the first thing to do is to check your language and inclusive language it is changing and what pe young people expect in terms of inclusive language is changing as well. Phrases that I would have used 15 years ago when I was working in an after school program, like, hey guys, let's get started now, may not feel very inclusive to some of the young people in your program. So it's really challenging, but um, think about how you're using gendered language or um, slang in a way that may make some people feel left out. When you're dividing students into small groups, you probably don't try to divide them out with boys on one side and girls on the other, but are there ways that you can work to make small groups more um, heterogeneous, more diversity among the small groups and help young people learn how to work together? That may be blending different ages within a small group, um, people with different experiences, helping our students learn how to work and be productive in heterogeneous groups is really important for success in STEM. Um, the suggestion about using role models, maybe one, or using roles uh, like recorder, presenter, um, however you're gonna set up those roles for the activity can um, be one way that helps those um, heterogeneous groups get started. Eventually, you hope that they can set their own roles and um, work in that way, but helping them with that structure is really important. Avoid using language like mom and dad in reference to students' classrooms. Again, it's things that um, when I was working in the field seemed normal that today we look at those with a little bit different point of view. And you really wanna think about how that um, tone comes across to students. Plan opportunities for students to share about themselves, their backgrounds and experiences, so you can learn more about them and they can learn more about each other, but don't put anyone on the spot. Be sensitive for individuals that don't want to share, but do make an effort to get to know them as much as you can. The better you are at knowing the individuals in your program, the easier it'll be to make connections for them and to help them see how this is meaningful. Next thing to think about is how are you going to establish ground rules um, for maintaining that positive tone in your program. It's essential that all the staff, all the team members from um, the program leader to the custodian know that it's have strategies, not just know that they should, but have strategies to interrupt when students are um, policing one another or shaming one another. Instead of ignoring it when someone makes fun of someone else for smelling funny or dressing different, let them know that that behavior isn't okay. Don't ignore harmful language because it can make the environment feel less safe. So even when it's not being used in a negative way, hold everyone accountable for setting a positive tone and an inclusive tone. And often students that have behavioral issues in our after school programs have unpredictable home environments. So providing a positive predictable space can help them build trust. Pay attention to what can be just driving misbehavior, things that are underlying um, behavior that's interrupting activities, and use restorative justice to address those underlying issues rather than focusing on the behavior itself. Next is enable active learning. Active learning is important because it develops skills and understanding in STEM and it supports a sense of belonging and being part of STEM. So plan activities that support youth in being problem solvers and using the practices of science or of computer science or of math so that they see themselves 
of someone who is contributing to that field in a positive way. Plan activities let students think about and show appreciation for each other and for people who are different from them. And perhaps most important, take advantage of different modes of learning in your program. Include opportunities for visual learning, auditory, kinesthetic, and collaborative learning. Encourage everyone to try new experiences, but again, be sensitive to those who may be uncomfortable with specific activities and try to find a way for them to be part of it, even if they don't feel like they're comfortable engaging in that way. The last one is make a commitment to change. This comes from the Click to Science coaching resource called Being More Inclusive. And I'll share that with the group in a little bit. And it uses, that resource uses SMART goals to support making a meaningful change in your practice. So in addition to having strategies, it's really important to actually make a commitment to changing, for, to doing things differently. So let's think about how we can do that. A SMART goal is a goal that is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. <clears throat> specific means that it is clear what you're trying to accomplish with the goal and that it really focuses on what you want to see change, what change you want to see. So make it specific, focused on the sort of change that you want to accomplish. Measurable, when a goal is measurable, it's easy to know that you've accomplished the goal. So you have some criteria that will help you know when you have reached a level of success. It may not be that you've reached your ultimate goal, but you've reached a mile point, uh, a, a bar of success that is measurable. Achievable means that the goal is something that you can accomplish in a fairly short time. It's not too big, something that's gonna take the whole school year to accomplish, and it's not too small. It shouldn't be something that would happen whether you set it as a goal or not. So it needs to be something that moves the bar to a level that you can measure, but it's achievable. It's not too big, not too small. And then realistic or relevant means that that goal is connected to what's actually happening in your program. It's relevant to what happens every day, and it's something that you have control over. It will help you make the change you wanna see. If your goal is that the students will behave in a different way, that may not be a realistic goal because that's not something you have control over. You have some input that affects students' behavior, but you're not controlling their behavior. So think about what it is that you can focus on, that you can make changes and measure the impact of those changes, but it's an area that you have control over. It's realistic and relevant for you and timely. I usually recommend that it's a goal that can be accomplished within the next month. Again, you don't want something that's too big and too far off. You can set some long-term goals, but you want to set then the steps that reach toward those long-term goals. And your SMART goal is going to be something that gets you closer to that long-term goal. But it's not too far off. It's not too small. So that you can accomplish it you can find that sweet spot where it's measurable progress toward where you want to be but it's achievable and it's something that makes sense in the time frame that you can do if you're not assessing whether you've reached that goal until the end of the semester or the end of the school year um, you can waste a lot of time if you are assessing your your progress every two weeks or every month then you're going to find that over the long term you make progress faster and it's easier to keep things moving. So SMART goals can be really helpful, especially if it is something that you're doing across your whole program. As a team, if you're working on SMART goals, 
you can um, be supportive of one another. You can hold each other accountable toward working toward those individual goals. A SMART goal is individual, but if everybody on the team has set their own goals, it can be really helpful for the program as a whole. Or it may be that there's a particular staff member that you want to mentor or coach. And SMART goals can be very useful for that individual too, but you want them to connect to others and have that support network of, of colleagues or of a, a coach or mentor that's gonna hold them accountable to their goals. We think about the same thing when we're setting a weight loss goal. It really helps to have a workout buddy so that um, you can have somebody that you're accountable to to show up to do what you've committed to doing. That's the same sort of thing I'm thinking about with SMART goals. As I said, there are a lot of resources at Click to Science on this topic of facilitating inclusive learning. So if, you, if broadening participation in your program or broadening participation in STEM is, is a really important goal to your program, I encourage you to look at those resources and to think about how you can build a whole set of experiences for your staff that can, our, that can help move them toward that overall goal of being more inclusive in your program. And if there's something in particular you want to try to accomplish, our team is more than happy to provide technical assistance or advising on how you can use those Click to Science resources or customize them for your program. When you go to the website, clicktosciencepd.org, there's a contact us button at the bottom of the page, and that's the best way to um, reach out if you'd like some support of that kind. As we are wrapping up today, I have four key ideas to take away, and then we're gonna come back to those people that we um, were thinking about earlier in the program uh, about how we want to help redefine success for them. So first, key ideas. Out-of-school programs have the potential to broaden participation in STEM. Partly that comes from who is in our programs, and also it comes from the type of activities that we can implement in after school. This idea of being able to try out STEM without have, being held accountable for grades or for tests can be really important for young people. So keep in mind that there is a lot of potential in your program to help broaden participation in STEM and, and think about specific ways you can do that. The second key idea is that diversity in STEM cultivates and uses the strengths of everyone to solve problems now and in the future. And that strengths-based approach is really important in terms of getting the most out of the goal of diversity. It's not diversity for the sake of being more diverse. We want to be diverse because it makes us better problem solvers. There's a real benefit to the field, to diversity. And you can see that in the efforts that are really impactful in making the field more, um, more welcoming. The third key takeaway is from that research study I shared earlier, that learning environments can be impactful in terms of challenging or reinforcing stereotypes. So it's important to think about um, how your environment in your after school program might reinforce stereotypes about who does STEM or might challenge those. Um, it's simple things like posters or images, but it's also things like how is the room set up for your robotics program? Does it feel like a space that is not the sort of space that the girls in your program want to be in? Those sort of environmental things can really affect interest. And if they're not interested, you're not gonna be able to engage them. So it's, it's the first step toward engagement. So think about the environment you have and how that is challenging 
are reinforcing stereotypes. And think about the ways that you can shift the environment that supports the interest of the stereotypical STEM kid, but also welcomes other kids. And then the fourth key, key takeaway is there are specific things we can do to create more inclusive STEM learning experiences in our programs. And that's why I wanna go back now to Ben and Sam and Josie. And I invite you, if you have some ideas for me, are there ways that I can use these strategies that we talked about to make my environment more welcoming for those young people? So let me go back to those strategies. One of the strategies that I really wanna think about in particular for Ben and Sam is what are the ground rules about what is expected for the, from them in terms of behavior? And I, they're the ones that have a lot of potential and a lot of leadership, but they're leading off in other directions. So one of the things I'm gonna take away from this is I think it's beneficial to sit down and just talk a little bit with Ben and Sam, not when things are out of control, but when, when things are going good and talk to them about what my expectations are and um, what their expectations are, not just what I want, but what they want out of the program too, and see if we can um, come up with some ground rules that are gonna make it more positive in terms of the experience for them. Are there things that I'm failing to do that would be really um, supportive and inviting for them? And I need to be willing to have that discussion, I think, to be able to make an environment that supports them. Josie, the um, one who's kind of on the outside of the activity, who, who's not very comfortable joining, seems to be a little intimidated by the other kids in the program. So I think I'm going to um, try to get to know her a little bit better to figure out what are my assumptions that may be inhibiting her engagement and are there ways that I can um, examine my assumptions and make it an environment where she feels more welcome and comfortable. So that's an example of how you can take these strategies and make a commitment to making specific changes. And the easiest way to think about that is to think about how, what are the um, what does success look like for these individuals? What are their strengths? What are the positive things about them? How can I use their strengths to engage them in the programming that I want to have them participating in, in a more positive way? So um, thank you very much for joining today, for being part of our webinar. And I encourage you to join us again next month in, on January 15th, the webinar topic will be plan and prepare. Prepare and plan, I think, actually. And we're going to focus on the lesson planning and the um, click to science skill, preparing yourself to facilitate STEM. And we'll have some resources that you can take back to your program to really help with that planning and preparing part of the STEM activity, that part that happens before anything begins in the program any activity, but if you can do that and do it with as little time as possible, um, but be prepared, it's gonna make a real positive impact on your program. So that's the topic for next month. And um, thank you for joining us today. If you want to see the recording of this webinar, it will be posted by the end of the week, hopefully by tomorrow, but sometimes I get interrupted and it doesn't get posted immediately the next day, but it'll be at clickthesciencepd.org slash webinars. And you'll be able to see this and all the other recorded webinars. So you can go back and look at those. Thanks again for joining us and have a great rest of your day.